It's good to have you with us today. We, it's good to be back with you, and we're excited to what the Lord's going to do in today's service. And uh, we have a little bit different, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, order of service. We're trying some things a little different, so you'll notice that as we uh, go through our services. Uh, but also, you can catch our announcements, and uh, Brother Evan's going to also come, but we're going to try to stress more on some of our announcements on screen uh, at about 15-minute mark or thereabout after until time for service to start. And uh, we're going to try to do some different things. But at this time, I'd like to welcome you to our services today, especially if you're a guest. You're always welcome. And if you don't have a church home, we'd love to have you here. And I'd say this choir looks really good. Don't y'all think this choir looks real good? I think they look real good this morning. They do. Um, wanted to uh, let you know we have several names that we are going to pray for today. Diane McNabb, uh, brother, uh, the Carney family, Brother James, and uh, also Brother Jay, both of them, I understand, have cancer. Uh, different kinds, and we need to pray for them, J uh, James and Jay Carney. Also, Wesley McGee, uh, Barbara Holmes is going to be having surgery. Also, Delton Morris, uh, Lance Reed family, and also Brock Birch, grandfather. Uh, those are the ones that we've added today to our list. We're going to have a time of prayer for these. I'm going to ask if you would to bow as we uh, th think about our neighbors and friends. Father, we thank you, Lord, for answered prayer. Uh, but, Lord, we also we know that there's ailments and and hurts and uh, needs, uh, not only physical, but God, their spiritual needs. And uh, we just pray, Lord, for those needs in our church family and on, these, on this prayer list. Uh, we just pray you would just bless, Lord, those that, uh, Lord, are, are going through a hard time right now. God, I just pray that you would to be with them as they uh, work through uh, situations. We pray for Crystal and her family as they go and regather and regroup and move forward. Uh, Lord, in the, uh, the house burning, we just pray for them and to be encouraged. We also pray, uh, thanking you, Lord, for letting us be here today, uh, God, to be able to come into this place, a place we call home, a place we can come worship, a place we can come and rejoice. And Lord, I just pray you would help us to stay focused on the King of kings and Lord of lords today because we come into this place, Lord, to lift the name of Jesus up. In Jesus' name, amen. But Evan, I think that it's your time. We're going to try to have a, a, a just a better flow through our service. So once we get started with music, we've pretty much going to go right straight through the preaching. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? All right, all right. Well, uh, just to say a little thing before uh, we get into announcements, yesterday I learned something about myself. Yesterday I ran a 5K, and uh, if you don't know, that's three miles in the mud and obstacles and so on and so forth, and I, and I noticed something about myself. I noticed that at the beginning of this 5K, I had a competitive spirit. I was going to get in there, I was going to outrun people, I was going to I was going to do great, and about halfway through, that competitive spirit turned into a survival spirit, and at that point, I had an older fella, he's probably in his 60s, running by, running by me, so he was passing me up, and he asked me, he said, how are you doing today? I said, wondering why I ever signed up to run this thing, and he laughed and kept on going, he didn't even, he didn't even like acknowledge, he didn't say, yeah, me too, you know, he just, he was like, okay, kept going. It's really sad. But yeah, that was my day yesterday. Hope y'all are having a great day. We did have uh, 176 present today in uh, Sunday school, with 10 of those being visitors and the rest being members. Also, there is going to be a short property committing, committee meeting uh, following the morning worship service for about five minutes right down here at the front. Also, today, happening in the life of our church, we are having a baptism out in the creek following morning worship service. And so, if the church family could uh, join us out there right after morning worship, that would be great. Property committee, you too, and y'all can maybe meet after the baptism. That would be great. Also, today at 5 o'clock, we do have a homecoming committee in the conference room, a homecoming committee meeting in the conference room. And then Tuesday, of course, 1130, we have our senior adult covered dish, lunch, and bingo out in the new fellowship hall. Uh, next Sunday, 7 a.m., all you men and boys, listen up. We have brotherhood breakfast happening out in the new fellowship hall. Uh, Brother Mark Wicker is going to be our speaker. It's going to be a great time. I encourage y'all to be there. Look, that's a little bit earlier than usual, but you just got to show up. Come ready to eat some good breakfast. The food has never disappointed me there. On also 1.30 next Sunday, we also have the Sip and See. We're going to celebrate the arrival of Scott William Gillis Jr. and congratulate the parents and grandparents of Scott and Lauren Gillis and Mike and Tammy Haney. That's going to be 1.30 out in the New Fellowship Hall next Sunday. And there is also, I believe, that is all the announcements I have for y'all this morning. Mm, it is indeed. I do would like to remind you that signups for these small groups are continuing. Uh, the parent small group, by, led by Miss Lori Lowe, is going to start 
uh, Thursday, the last Thursday in August. And so if you have not signed up for that and you have young children and you are interested in raising them in a Christ-centered way, I'd encourage you to get signed up. They only have about six spots left for that small group, so go ahead and get signed up for that. Also, our other small groups are going to start the first full week in September, and you can get plugged into those as well. And all those sign-up sheets are actually in a catalog right here on the table. And so there's not four sheets just kind of spread out across the table. You can go open that catalog, look through it. You'll see how many spots are available. You'll see the group leader's name. You'll see uh, when we'll be meeting, so on and so forth. And, of course, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know, and I'll answer them best as I can. And that is all the announcements. I do want to read a piece of Scripture to you all as we uh, get started in our worship service. It comes out of Matthew chapter 13. It's only one verse. I'm holding back this morning, but this verse is chock full of uh, deep theological thoughts, and here it is, the kingdom of heaven. This is Jesus speaking, verse 44, Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. We're talking about a, a man who is sold out the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the kingdom of heaven. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, we come before you recognizing that this world that we live in seeks to actively distract us from pursuing you. Father, whether it be through social media, whether it be through music, TV, uh, sports, whatever it may be that tempts us to be distracted, I pray, God, that they would not have victory over us. I pray, God, that by the empowering of your Holy Spirit in each of our hearts and lives, God, you would give us strength to say no when this thing would become a distraction, when it would become a problem for us to follow you. Because, God, we read in the text that your kingdom is worth giving up everything to pursue and to follow. And, Lord, that's a radical thought here in 21st century America. I'm sure that it was a radical thought in first century Israel as well. But God, the call remains the same. So Lord, I pray that our hearts would be set upon you. God, that the distractions would leave us. God, that you would give us victory over those things. And Lord, that when we fail, because we, we know we're going to fail, that is who we are as people. We are sinful, wicked, failing little people. I pray that your grace and your mercy would be upon us, that we would be humble enough to ask for forgiveness, and that we would be humble enough to seek you despite the failures in our lives. God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to gather in this place. I pray, God, for my brother. I pray that you would help him to preach and teach your word boldly, accurately, and effectively. And God, may you produce a harvest in this place this morning, not only in our sanctuary, but also in our chapel as the children uh, go over there to meet. We thank you so much for what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Thank you for him being our sacrifice, our redemption, and our righteousness. We cannot do this without him. And it's by his name, the name of Jesus, that I pray and ask these things. Amen and amen. Amen. Good morning. Did want to mention to you this morning, we did have our monthly golf tournament yesterday, and we are starting to try to raise money for missions. Yesterday, we, we raised $180 that will be going to Brotherhood. So uh, if you have a need, you can contact me or Ben or Brock or somebody uh, uh, in that golf tournament, and we'll, we'll get that need met. Uh, and come join us to play next month. All right, different order of service. Let's stand. We're, this will be our offertory hymn, okay? First thing, offertory hymn. Hymn number 230. We'll sing first one, two, and four. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange its song 
Amen. Let's stand together. I want you to greet each other as the choir and instrumentalists sing and play. Let's stand. Children, you can go to Children's Church, okay?
Mighty is our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord. Let's sing together this morning. Mighty is our God, mighty is our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord.
Everything we have, all that we are, we give to you, Jesus, that you might receive glory and honor now and forever. Number 35, Tim. Choir. Thank you, choir. We will be practicing today at 4.30. If you'd like to come join us, we'd love to have you. We'll continue in worship. You can remain seated. We'll sing hymn number 229, and we'll go straight into hymn number 5. cleansing power are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you fully trusting in his grace is our are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are your garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 
the splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice, it trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. H to H. H to H he stands. And time is in his hands. Beginning and the end. Beginning and the end. God had three and one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great. is our God. Um, I'm going to sing a song this morning that my wife actually requested for me to do. One of her favorites is Through the Fire. times I've questioned certain circumstances of things I could not understand. Many times in trials, weakness blurs my vision. My frustration gets so out of hand. But it's then I am reminded never been forsaken I've never had to stand the test alone as I look at all the victories the spirit rises up in me and through the fire my weakness is made strong he never promised that the cross would not get heavy and the hill would not be hard to climb. He never offered victories without fighting, but he said help would always come in time. Just remember when you're standing in the valley of decision, and the adversary says, give me just hold on. My Lord will show up, and he will take you through the fire again. I know within myself that I would surely perish. But if I trust the hand of God, He'll shield the flames again, again. He never promised that the cross would not get heavy.
when he writes and he sings I tell you what it's just powerful it's awesome to be able to, to worship the Lord it, that's a powerful song if you think about the words what it's saying that's true we've all been in the fire and he's going to bring us through it one more time well if you have your Bibles we're going to look in the fourth message in this series that we're preaching is a, a series about out of options in Ch Exodus in the Old Testament the 14th chapter if you will roll over into the chapter 14 we're going to ask, if you would, to keep your uh, little piece of paper, whatever it may be, your bookmark right there, because we're going we're gonna to scratch a spot out and sit there for a while. We're going to go and look at that in just a few moments. But Exodus chapter 14, I'm going to talk to you today about Catch-22. Have you ever been in a Catch-22 in your life before? Well, uh, have you ever faced a situation where you felt like that you were just boxed in and there was no way out whatsoever? You didn't know which way to turn. You know, you're coming to the end of your month, and you've already come to the end of your money. We've all been there at one time or another in our life. The rent's due. The electric bill's due. Uh, you know, it appears that there's no way out. Perhaps you've applied for four different jobs. You've been rejected by all of them. It appears that there's no way in on a situation like that. Maybe you feel like that you are hopelessly hooked on drugs, or maybe pornography or alcohol, or maybe bitterness has overtaken your life, and you say, there's just no way out of this situation, and you're what we call a predicament. You know what a predicament is? Well, it's amazing what we call in the South, and when we get in some situations, we call it up a creek without a paddle. We call it that, and we call it in a jam. And also one of the big ones is, uh, I'm between a rock and a hard place. You ever been between a rock and a hard place before in your life? You know, you, you're in the, that proverbial catch-22. Uh, it appears that as if there's no matter what you do, no matter what path you take, what decision you make, it seems like that you're doomed in your life. And it's what we describe in a word as a predicament. And it can be related to your job. It can be related to your marriage. It can be related to your kids. Or maybe it's something that you're dealing with personally on the inside of your life. Uh, maybe you're in a tight place and you see there's no way out and you say this morning that you are in a predicament you don't know what to do well the de best definition of a predicament that I can think of it uh, that I read before it reads like this a predicament occurs when an attorney that specializes in suing doctors for medical malpractice and then he finds himself in need of major surgery you think about that now that's a huge predicament we've all been in a, uh, a series for the last several weeks and it's really nice to be back with you. We call this series Out of Options. You may feel like that you've been out of options for a while. And as you go through life, you're going to find yourself in situations. Sometimes it's not of your own making. Sometimes it's, it's, we just don't know why we find ourselves in a situation like that, where it appears that, that you are totally out of options. And what we've been saying this entire time through these weeks that we've been preaching this message is that with God, you are never out of options. You're never out of options. And so today we're going to, to look at the greatest catch-22, perhaps, that's ever been on the face of this earth in chapter 14 in the book of Exodus. It's the most involved predicament the nation of Israel would ever see. And yet they live to tell the story, and they tell that story even to this very day. It became the most celebrated event in all of Jewish history. And two words tell you all you need to know. It's called the Exodus. 
And we pick up the story in chapter 14, verse number 1. So what we're going to do is read a verse. We'll talk a little bit about it. And I'm going to trudge down through here, and we're going to see where we can go with this. And uh, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before Phihahiriath, between Migdal and the sea, and you shall camp in front of Balzaphon, opposite it, by the sea. The problem with Balzaphon was a geographical cul-de-sac. Now, do you know what a cul-de-sac is? Somebody tell me what a cul-de-sac is. Yes, ma'am, Miss Diane. That's right. You go down a street, it looks like a dead end, don't it? And you have to turn around down there. They have a little turnaround spot. Thank you very much. And so it's a dead-end street. And here is what these Israelites were facing in this chapter here. To the north, there was this huge Egyptian fortress. It was a, a massive stone structure, and it couldn't, couldn't be attacked. And so to the south of them uh, lay nothing but the Egyptian desert. There was no protection. There was no water. There was no food. And so when you look to the west, you find that there was Pharaoh, there was Egypt, there was this huge army. And so to the east, there was the Red Sea, and they call that sea today the, uh, the Gulf of Suez. And it was a catch-22 of all catch-22s. If you go in any direction, you were going to die. If you stay put where you are, you're going to die. And they were dressed up, but they didn't have any place to go. And so normally I would spoil the ending by telling you what would happen, but you already know it. You know what happens in the Exodus. For those of you that might not or need to be reminded, God parts the sea, and of course the children of Israel, they walk right on across it. And then he closes the waters back in the Egyptian armies. They drown, and, and then, of course, it saves the day. You know, I believe this story happened exactly the way that God says it happened, and I've heard all the various theories. In seminary, you think that everybody is conservative and everybody believes it as it's written in the Bible. That's not the case a lot of times. And it saddened me to hear that, but I had an uncle to tell me. He was a pastor, and, and he told me, he said, before you go into seminary, you need to know there's going to be some folks down there. They're not going to believe quite like what we've been believing. And I'm like, and I found that out. He said, you know what's right, but you just put it in your head and let it go right out. He said, you know what's truth and what's error. And there was this one scholar one time that decided to, he would enlighten his friend, and his friend was not that educated, and, and he told him that the Red Sea was really only six inches deep. It was not really a sea at all is what he said. And so he, he was expecting this strong counter-argument. And so this, this man that was a, quote, scholar, he was really surprised. He said, and the guy he was talking to, he said, really? He said, man, he said, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. And this man that was a scholar was like, really? You, you really like my explanation of the Red Sea? And the man said, yeah. He said, you better believe it. He said, I have, I have never realized the Lord drowned all those armies of Egypt in just six inches of water. Man, what a miracle get thinking about that you know and I believe I've saved the best lesson in this in this message and the four messages for the last and that is when we do what's possible God does what is impossible now you think about that for just a minute when we do what's possible God does the impossible God never expects us to do what only he can do but he does expect us to do what we can do and then he's gonna do what he can do and when you are in a catch-22, I want to share with you very quickly about three or four things this morning, if you have a list of guys. I don't know, some of you, we may have run out of list of guys if we did, I don't know. Did everybody get a list of guys? I don't, maybe need to print more of them. Did everybody get a list of guys that wanted one? Yeah? Okay, good. I just don't want to waste. But when you're in a catch-22, I want to share with you what you need to do. When you find yourself in a predicament, and I believe with all of my heart that this will, this will work. This will work. Number one, you need to go where God leads you to go. Now you think about this. I want you to keep in mind where the Israelites are in, the, in their history. They have been living down there in that place called Egypt for 430 years. And all the Israelites that God was about to deliver through Moses, they, had been, they hadn't been raised to know anything but slavery all those, their lives. They were, they were Israelites, but yet they just knew oppression. And, and so they were Egyptian to the core. And they ignored God, and now they needed to learn to adore God. And we need to go back to see exactly how they got to this point. So now we're going to look in the 13th chapter in verse number 18. I'm going to read a verse there in Exodus 13, 18. It says, Hence God led the people around by the day of the wilderness to the Red Sea, and the sons of Israel went up 
in martial array from the land of Egypt. Now listen to that phrase again. Exodus 13, 18. Hence God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea, and the sons of Israel went up in martial array from the land of Egypt. They had, they had not made a mistake. They had not made a miscalculation. They had not taken a wrong turn. You see, back then, they had GPS. They just didn't realize that. They had, it was known as God's positioning system, not global positioning system. And so God had purposely led them to the Dead Sea. And so why did God do that to them? You know, why does God do that to us? God's going to lead us to a dead end sometimes, and we'll be forced to trust Him. And we'll be forced to follow him for a way out. And there's one school that God enrolls you in that you never graduate from. And it's called the school of faith. Faith is it's not a talent, folks, that you're born with. Faith is a lesson that you learn. And God is the professor. You never quit learning to trust the Lord. As long as you live, you need to trust God. But the bad news was God led him to the Red Sea. And here's the good news in Exodus 14, 21. If you're following and then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, so the waters was divided. God never leads us where he does not go before us. I think that's pretty rich. It may be simple, but it's true. Listen to what I just said. I think that's one of those life, life phrases, maybe, not necessarily a verse, but God never leads us where he does not go before us. And if you follow God, he goes with you. If you don't follow God, you go by yourself. That's scary. You run ahead of God, you go on your own. And so you're going to see in just a moment there's times that God's going to lead you to a place of despair. And you may be into a place of desperation in your life. And you're going to stay there until you make it a place of complete dependence on God. Every day from the time your feet hit the floor, you should sign a declaration of dependence upon God. You've got to depend upon God not only to lead you wherever He wants you to go, but to make a way out once you get there. And so you can't cross the Red Sea until you come to the Red Sea. You will never experience, and if you don't get anything else out of this message today, please carry this home with you. You will never experience the greatness of God, the power of God, the love of God, and the glory of God until you allow God to put you in a place where only God can make a way out. Now let me say that again, because some of you are writing that down. You will never experience the greatness of God, the power of God, or the love of God, and the glory of God until you allow God to put you in a place where only God can make a way out. And you know what? God can resolve a catch-22. A lot of folks try every friend they have. They try everything possible. And it's true that we need to do what we need to do, but yet we never depend on God. We use Him as a spare tire as a last resort sometimes. And so that's why the greatest way to know God and the only way to experience God is to follow God wherever He leads you. So number one, you need to follow God wherever He leads you. Number two, do what God tells you to do. A lot of us... We probably have known what God wanted us to do for a long time, but we have never stepped across that threshold to say, I want to do what God wants me to do. You know, there's a point in the, the movie, you're watching a movie, and there's a point in the movie where the music begins to get very climactic, and the scene is about to take place, that it's the awesome, uh, it's going to end with a crescendo. And, and so the Israelites, they could hear the hooves of the horses thundering down upon them, and, and they could see the spears and the swords gleaming there in the sun as they were there. And they could feel the heat of the fire coming from the eyes of Pharaoh as he was looking. And it looks like they're literally in their last moments of their life, and it looks like there is no way out for them. Now, if you was Moses, how in the world would you respond? We might want to say, run! But that didn't happen. We might be tempted to ask, does anybody have a white flag? I want to raise it. You know, Many of us would just look up to heaven and say, well, this is another fine mess you've got me into, Lord. you just got me in a mess again. How does Moses respond? Exodus 14, 13, look what he said. He said, but Moses said to the people, do not fear, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. 
Can you hear what these people are saying to him? Here he says, fear not. And all they say, that's all you've got is fear not. That's all you can say. I mean, I, I hear, you know, it might be like that, that Jewish version of Johnny Cash singing that song I loved as a little boy about that train coming around the bend. You know, singing in the background. You could just hear as they were talking to Moses that, that Jewish uh, uh, Johnny Cash singing, I hear that train a coming. It's rolling around the bend of uh, Egypt. It's just about to stick the sword in our back end. And the best that you've got is fear not. It gets better. Moses is not done. Listen to what else he said. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which will accomplish for you this day. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, will, you'll never see them again. Sounds kind of like a, you know, don't fear. You know, don't run. Be calm. Stand firm. Be confident. Just watch and see the salvation of the Lord. So the question is, why does Moses give them that kind of advice? And it seems like that they are facing a dead end. It's at those moments that you cannot panic. Now, don't miss that. You've got to listen to the voice of God. God will speak to you. He will talk to you. He will show you what to do. But once you've done all you know to do, then you must simply wait and see what God can do. And when you're standing before the Red Sea in your life, the sea will part. And I'm sure that those Israelites were very impatient. They were waiting for they want God to hurry up. They wanted God to work on their timetable. But God doesn't wear a watch, folks. Don't I ever forget that because time means nothing to God. Timing means everything. Now, time and timing is different. Timing means everything to God. He'll never part the Red Sea of your life until you first go where he sends you and you do what he tells you to do and you do it in his time. And in perfect timing, he'll act. But then number three, you need to believe what God says he will do. A lot of us don't believe what God tells us. Let, you know, let, let's, let's set up the final scene here. God, God has, a, the, he set the hook himself. Verse number four, in chapter 14 and verse number four of Exodus. It says, thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after them and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all of his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord and they did so. Notice what it said, and they did so. God wasn't going to make it easy for the Israelites to make their escape. Or they would have probably thought, well, look what I've done. You know, I've really done this. You know, they would get the glory. They'd pat themselves on the back again and again. But God always, he always has a method to the madness that we see around us. And look, verse number 9 in chapter 14. It says, Then the Egyptians chased after them with all of the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them camping by the sea beside Thihar Herioth in front of Balzaphon. Now he has 600 of his selected chariots. We're talking about old uh, Pharaoh. And they're being ridden by the best officers that Egypt had to offer. They were the army rangers. They were the Delta Force. They were the Navy SEALs. They were the special forces that they had. And Pharaoh had his best so Israel could experience in his mind the worst. And he had Israel right where God wanted them. And all God says to Moses is face the Red Sea and move forward. March forward. No nation has ever done this before. And this is the first time that an entire nation has simply marched out from under the bondage of another nation without firing a single shot, without wielding a spear, without drawing a sword. And Moses had certainly never led an exodus before. I mean, he had never been to the school of exodus ideology. There was no map. There was no three-ring binder that says, this is what you need to do. You couldn't get to, to the Internet and be able to see how to do an exodus. There was nothing to do now except to simply do what God told them to do. And believe what God said he was going to do. You probably know the story. You know the rod that he has. He lifts that rod out up over the sea. And what happens when he does that? Is he fishing? No. God parts the sea. There's a gigantic wall on either side. Two million Israelites, they make their way through the dry land and the Egyptian army follows like lambs going to the slaughter. And God removes his hand and there's a, a, basically a divine dam break. And the water of wall covers the Egyptian army and they drown. The Israelites probably broke out and, 
and, and that old song that you've heard before, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was in Egypt, but now I'm found, and old Pharaoh is in the city. That's not the end of the story, though. Because the greatest thing that really happened was not the Red Sea party. Really? That's right. Here's why the story is one of the greatest stories in the Bible, and it's celebrated by the Jewish people and Christ followers. God kept every promise that he made. The Egyptians was wiped out just as God said they would be. And God said that he would be glorified, and the Egyptians would know that he is the Lord. You go back to verse number 25, and you listen to what these Egyptians said in their last words just before they died. Folks, I'm going to tell you something that's jumped off the page at me. In Exodus 14, 25, man, this, listen. It says, he caused their chariots' wheels to swerve, and he made them to drive with difficulty. So the Egyptians said, let us flee from Israel. And here it is. For the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. For the first time, the Egyptian pagan people, they had acknowledged the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and even called him by his name. And more than that, for the first time, the nation of Israel had come home to God. In Exodus 14, verse 30 and 31, it says, Thus says the Lord, He saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. And Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians. The people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. In 430 years of forgetting God and believing all about God, what did they learn and what have we learned in this situation? When you find yourself in a catch-22, you're in a situation that is out of control. You need to remember it is firmly in God's control. When there is no other place to look, you can always look up. Not a single Egyptian lived through that ambush. And not a single Hebrew received a scratch. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. That's the kind of God we serve, brother. Amen. We serve that kind of God. God's people walked along the seashore. They saw it littered with these dead Egyptians. And they, hadn't, they hadn't killed a single man. They hadn't fought a single battle. They didn't use a single sword. They followed where God led them to go. They did what God told them to do. And they believed what God said he was going to do. And that still is not the end of the story. Moses had the task of leading anywhere from two to three million people through the wilderness, which would require, and here we go. Now, you're going to have to listen close to catch all I'm about to say. This is my blowing. Moses had the task of leading all these folks, two to three million people, through the wilderness. And it was going to require 15 tons of food every day. Enough food that would require two freight trains one mile long to be able to feed them. And it also required 4,000 tons of firewood every day, which would fill more than eight freight trains each a mile long. And this would be needed for 40 years. And it would take 11 million gallons of water to drink and bathe every day. And that would take a freight train with tank cars 1,800 miles long. Just to get that many people across the Red Sea in one night, if they marched double file, the line would be 800 miles long and would require 30 days and nights to get through there. To walk through it in one night as they did, they had to walk 5,000 abreast in a three-mile-wide span as they, in the sea as they walked across. And every time they camped, they would need a campground two-thirds the size of Rhode Island, which would be 750 square miles. Now, that's, that's a big bunch of stuff. You, do you think that Moses had a, this thing figured out before he left? I mean, what in the world was he doing? Was he just going to, to just la, 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 What was he doing? He was doing what God told him to do, and he was believing what God said he was going to do. But that still is not the end of the story. What the Exodus is in the Old Testament, the resurrection is in the New Testament. The Exodus is a picture of what Jesus Christ has done for us. We face a Red Sea, and that Red Sea is called sin. And behind us, it was death because Christ held a cross over that Red Sea of sin, and he parted it. And as our resurrected Lord, He can lead us through to the promised land. I want to tell you where we will live with Him forever and ever and ever. You need to just remember, when you are in that dead end, when you are in that catch-22, between that rock and that hard place, and you think that you are out of options with God, 
there is always an option with God. There's an always an option with God. You may be sitting here this morning and pondering in your mind. You may say, Brother Tim, I'm going to catch 22. And I'm in that dead end. I'm in that cul-de-sac. I'm in a situation. Go where he sends you. Believe what he said he was going to do. Trust him. Because the same God those people serve is the very same God that we serve today, right now. It's the same God, and he's not changed at all. We serve an awesome God. And we serve a mighty God. And when you find yourself in a catch-22, you're not out of options. So lift your head up, weary friend, and trust in the Lord. He will guide your way. You might need to come for prayer this morning. You might need to come down here to his altar and pray. You might need to come down here and get something right in your life with God because you've gotten bitter at God because of some situation you found yourself in. And you say, God, life is not fair. Well, God didn't say it's always going to end up like you wanted it to. Situations we find, and we may ask why. We serve a God that is a just God, and a righteous God, and a loving God. And God is going to take care of you if you'll just trust Him. Sometimes it gets hard, don't it? when you're on your back and you're looking straight up. Sometimes you have to look up and see the bottom, don't you? I've been in that crowd where the Egypts, where the, the God's people was fussing at Moses. I remember as a kid growing up, people fussed at our pastor a lot. And, why did we do this? And why did we do that? This is what we felt God lead us to do. And then we realized... I've been in the crowd who was a grumbler. You and I both have been on the both sides of the fence. We've been there before where God's led us and we've seen God's hand, and yet we still doubt God. Don't doubt God. Are you out of options in your mind? You always have an option with God. Let us pray. Lord, help us to never use you like a, an old tire in a trunk of a car. Lord, help us to be a trusting person, a child who will trust you as our Heavenly Father. Father, we will, we will come to our senses and we will come to realize that we need to do what God tells us to do, go where God sends us to go and trust that God's going to do what he said he was going to do. Lord, we know that we serve a God that is alive and living and powerful. Even when things don't turn out like we want it to in life, help us, Lord, not to get bitter. We don't understand it, but we have to trust you. I pray right now, God, if there's somebody here today that their heart and their life is not where it needs to be, Father, I pray they would get their life right with the Lord today. They would come back to where they need to be. They would learn to adore God and honor God by what they do, what they say, and how they live. Father, if there's somebody here today that don't know the Christ as their Lord and Savior, and God has dealt with their heart about repenting of their sin and turning their life over to Christ, making Him Lord and Master of their life, Father, I pray today would be that first step. Lord, we know it's not by the works that we do. It's by grace, through faith in Lord Jesus Christ, that we're saved. Lord, that's so hard for some people to understand. Just believe. Lord, we know, God, you still save. You still transform. You still change. And you still give hope. And I pray for the person that feels hopeless in this crowd today, that they would look to Christ that is their only hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand as we invite you to come today. I've wandered far away from God though I'm coming home the paths of sin too long I've tried Lord I'm coming home come
I'd like to remind each of you about the baptismal service we're about to have down at the creek and so don't forget about that <clears throat> excuse me and tonight we're gonna I'm gonna begin a series and it's gonna be quite long but we're gonna be studying first Corinthians and uh, so you think you've got problems well uh, that's what this basically whole series is about we're gonna look at the church of Corinth and uh, for the book of first Corinthians we're gonna walk through and look at these different chapters and uh, we're gonna preach through them so we encourage you to come be a part of that tonight. Small groups are growing. A lot of people are signing up for those. We're really excited about it. And uh, we are possibly, but they haven't and I have talked about it. We're looking at the possibility of starting a small group for, ch for children and also working possibly with a small group for preteens. I mean, uh, the um, lower elementary. Anyway, my mind's not working tonight. Um, <clears throat> if you would, please, please be in prayer for Brent. He's going to be having surgery the 31st of this month. Have heart surgery. So ask if you would to remember Brent as he gets ready for that. And also, anyway, I go for a little scan of all my heart. So see what's going on with it. Any word before we go? Okay, we have two golf carts. If you need a ride down to the creek, and uh, right at the front here. Thank you for sure. Any other word? Brandy wanted to remind all parents to come pick their kids up from Children's Church. They don't want to turn them loose in the creek. So. Okay. Yeah. Come by. And pick your child up in Children's Church. We're back in the chapel. It's cooling again. They do have uh, the air conditioner. They're hooked up, and we're excited about that. So we're it's here today in our chapel, back where it was at. You have anything? Choir practice, 4.30. Choir practice, 4.30 today. All right. And uh, so let's, anybody else have any word before we go? Don't forget we're going down the creek and for a baptism. And pray for, uh, for all these that have made a profession of faith in Christ, many of them lately. Cliff, would you lead us? 